Good morning and welcome to Hope Fellowship of Somerset. We meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. for Fun Food and Fellowship. Today we are going to be talking about walking in the ways of Yahweh. And this is part five of a sermon series we began at the beginning of the year. Today is June 6th, uh, 2021. And I'm looking forward to preaching the sermon. I had it gave, I had enough time between the two weeks that I was working on it to start over because my father said yesterday morning, or I mean uh, Friday morning, you're doing it differently. So I got to rewrite the entire sermon on Friday. But I think it's a better teaching sermon than it was before. Today we are going to worship in teaching because we still want to know the ways of Yahweh. Um, to our friends in Indonesia, Pakistan, and India, this is a good one for you all to uh, think about, to meditate on, to munch on spiritually, and allow it to uh, be a savory taste in your mouth. For our friends who are in Uganda that are watching us online, you're going to enjoy this by Makuma. You will enjoy this. I really believe you will. I will use my cadence correctly, I hope, and hopefully not get so excited about what I'm preaching that I lose sight of who's listening. Um, to our friends in Cuba, I know you want this. And all of our other friends from other sources who are watching us on YouTube um, and in Rumble, enjoy. To start off with, let's pray. Father, your word is true all the time. I pray that I will be a conduit of truth, that every word that proceeds from my mouth will bring glory to your holy name. Do not let me speak anything out that you don't want others to hear. I pray that as I preach this sermon, that it will bring glory to you and honor and praise to you as well as edification to those who hear it. Let your word be true and help us not to stand in the way of your word. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. We must know the ways of Yahweh, part 5. When we walk in the ways of Yahweh, we will never stumble. I always like to start my sermons with a, a joke. Sometimes I get some giggles. Sometimes they want to run me out on the rail. But today it's, I will take the fifth on that. Several women appeared in court each accusing the others of causing the trouble that they were having in the apartment building where they lived. The judge, with Solomon-like wisdom, decreed, Okay, I am ready to hear the evidence. I will hear the oldest first. The case was dismissed for the lack of testimony. And if you don't get it, think about it. Going to the introduction, the ways of the righteous and the ways of the unrighteous are contrasted throughout Scripture in light of the ways of Yah. Okay, I'm getting looks. Women don't like to confess their age. Right? None of them want to talk about their age. Age and weight are a non-starter in conversations between men and women. So... The women didn't testify because no one wanted to admit they were the oldest. Okay, I'm leaving it at that. We will see from this introduction and in this sermon that the Psalms and Isaiah are replete with references and instructions for walking in the ways of Yahweh along with other scripture. We live in a world that is becoming more and more perverse than at any other time in history. We must keep watch over the spiritual temperature of people we are associated with in these last days. Psalm 1-1 says, Blessed is the person who does not follow the advice of the wicked people, take the path of sinners, or join in the company of mockers. Last week we learned that Psalm 1 is the gateway and foundation for the rest of the Psalms. It is laid out in a way that the remaining psalms can relay their messages to believers and Jews alike. Psalm 1 declares the blessed well-being of the righteous and the misery and destiny of the wicked. 
It summarizes everything that flows from all of the Psalms and all of Elohim's word. Psalm 1 introduces two ways of life a believer can pursue, the way of the righteous and the way of the sinful. A believer cannot be both. He or she has to choose life over death da uh, daily. It describes the importance of Elohim's word for life and fruitfulness of the righteous ones who truly love, reflect on, study, and apply his word to their lives and hearts, faithfully walking in him. Psalm 1-1 begins on a negative note by exhorting believers not to be active in three main areas of their lives. The negative only describes the positive blessings found in staying away from unbelievers. The world has turned diametrically from a following holiness to embracing unholiness, sin, and all the forms of perversity. We are in the days where evil is called good and good is called evil. Things have changed exponentially over the past century. We now live in the days where there is a decline and desire for believers to follow the will, way, and word of Elohim. It won't get better. Rather, Elohim's word has become an annoyance for those who don't, don't walk, want to walk with Messiah on his terms. They, t they hold to the form of Elohim-filled life, but deny his power to transform them. In Psalm 1, the way of the righteous and the way of the unrighteous are contrasted. It reveals those who walk in the ways of Yahweh and those who walk in the ways of Satan and this fallen world. Psalm 1 first tells a believer what not to do. A believer do doesn't take worldly counsel of unbelievers, doesn't embrace unholy lifestyles, and doesn't engage with those who mock holy lifestyles. Yahweh promises blessings to those who are committed to remaining in His way. Yahweh's will, way, and word stand in sharp contrast to the ways that this sinful world embraces. Those who desire the blessing and approval of Yahweh must be determined not to walk as this world walks. We are not to walk in the counsel of those who reject a relationship with Elohim. There is very little respect for what Elohim's word has to say about holiness and blessing. We must rise above the lustful standards of this world. Our lifestyle must be different than the, that of the world. As believers, we must encourage each other to seek, study, and apply Elohim's word to our in our lives. To many believers, fallen and nominal alike, uh, don't take Elohim's word seriously, nor believe it. We must set our eyes on the course that Messiah has set for us and not be influenced by the standards of this world. We must live in obedience to Elohim's word and not by what this world dictates to us. In these last days, we cannot watch television without seeing advertising for sexual fulfillment, gaining wealth by buying gold and silver, or politicians and religions pursuing a new world order. Humanity is transitioning to be like the Epicureans who declare that to us to eat, drink, and be merry, regardless of the cost to others, or the consequences it will face when it is determined to satisfy itself. Elohim's word is becoming an anchor to days gone by rather than being a lifeboat for the, to the dying. It is seen as a great paperweight rather than containing the word of life that can transform broken lives. Some Christians have decided that personal Bible study isn't necessary. Today's internet and satellite Bible teachers make it easy for rebellious believers to stay home and not be accountable to others. Both Psalm 1 and Psalm 119 exhort believers to become students of Elohim's word. It is our most important and highest priority. His word opens our hearts to all new worlds of truth and hope. There is not 
a more appropriate way to understand the Messiah-filled life than to understand the importance of studying Elohim's Word, since it contains His Word of Life, whom we must know. According to the original language of Elohim's Word, blessed means to be in a right relationship with Elohim, so that our lives are filled with deep personal satisfaction found only in Him and His Word. The word blessed carries along with it the joy of knowing Yahweh personally and knowing that we are accepted by Him and His beloved Son. Joy is not a result of our circumstances, but of our faith. The joy of Elohim's blessings doesn't come from merely asking for them, but from the faith we are living. Blessings come from holy living and rejecting sinful living. They are based on our choices. Psalm 1 assures believers that it is possible to live a blessed and joyful life, but only on Elohim's terms. The world only offers entertainment, cheap thrills, and temporary pleasures, nothing more. True happiness, authentic joy, and complete peace can, be, can only be found in Adonai Messiah Yeshua. In Him are the words of life, because He is the word of life, and we find our lives encapsulated in His. We are le learning that Psalm 1 provides alternatives for living. One of them is to search out Elohim's word for applications of truth to apply to each believer's life that will result in Elohim's blessings. The other, or, or worse, the worse alternative, is to neglect Elohim's word at our peril and receive consequences that will be painful and destructive. Instead of li living his life, we will end up in the squalor of death. Messiah told us that Elohim's word contains life in every period and punctuation point from beginning to end, and that each and every word in Elohim's word is vital and applicable to life. Psalm 1-2 introduces the lifestyle of believers in contrast to Psalm 1-1. It presents a positive lifestyle that true believers will desire, not the negative lifestyle saints, saints will not live. Psalm 1-2 says he delights in the Torah of Yahweh and reflects on his Torah day and night. Psalm 1-2 postulates that the righteous people who ignore advice from wicked people avoid the lifestyles of sinners and reject uniting with mockers to receive blessings from Elohim's word. The attitude of a righteous person should be that he or she will delight in the Torah of Yahweh. The Hebrew word for delights is kafetz and means to take or receive much pleasure in something. The fundamental issue underlying the Sermon of the Mount was over the interpretation of Torah. The person who exercises love for Elohim's word is the same person who receives his blessings. Everyone who exercises love for Elohim's word and applies his word demonstrates a remarkable lifestyle of moral, spiritual, and physical blessings far above anything they could imagine. The principle rooted in Psalm 1 is the study of Elohim's word. It is to be one of the key purposes and activities in our lives in which we take delight and to which we give careful attention. The object of our delight love and application is Torah of Yahweh. Torah in this context refers to Elohim's word. The Hebrew word for Torah, Torah is ta Torah and means law, teaching, instruction. One of the reasons Elohim's word and Torah should be experienced as a delicate delight, like honey found in a honeycomb, is because it is his truth unadulterated by unbelief and misapplication. The Hebrew word for reflects Hagah and is I'm sorry is Hagah and means to moan, growl, utter, muse, mutter, medicate, or I'm sorry, meditate, 
devise, plot, and speak. There are several very interesting ways in which it is used in scriptures. Scripture. In, in Isaiah 71.24, the word Hagah is also used to remember and to consider. The word reflex can mean in this in the context of Psalm 1 2 that this person needs Elohim's word, I mean sorry, reads Elohim's word to himself in a low tone. He delights in the Torah. It is emphatic in a couple of ways according to its context. One of the ways it is emphatic is that it should be read. It is literally in the Torah of Yahweh is his delight. Elohim's emphasis is on his Torah. And so he wants his Torah to be the object of our delight. Again, the Hebrew word delights is kefetz. It has an etymology or religion, I'm sorry, origin from an Arabic word. Kefetz in its fuller a def definition means to be mindful of, to pay attention to. After a while, it came to mean to keep safe, to guard and protect. When we delight in something, we tend to protect it. The word kefetz used for delights originally meant to bend, to incline to toward. It carried the idea of fulfilling a desire having a pleasure, inclination, or satisfaction. It is a term used for positive volition. The emphasis of the word delights or kefets is that the desire or favor towards something is caused in the subject by the intrinsic qualities that are found in the object that it desires or favors. Isaiah 54.12 reflects this attitude when Yahweh says to Israel after her exile that I will rebuild your towers with rubies, your gates with sparkling stones, and all your walls with precious stones. The Hebrew word for, uh, I'm sorry, the Hebrew verb form of kephetz is used several times to describe a man taking pleasure or finding delight in the wife he loves. When a man finds a wife, he receives favor from Yahweh. Israel is seen as the wife of Yahweh in the Old Covenant writings. In the New Covenant writings, the assembly is the bride of Messiah Yeshua. Elohim's written word is his love letter to us. Elohim's desire for all of the saints, both Jewish and Christians, is for them to have a love affair with him through his word. His love letter is written to us as his sweethearts. He wants us to delight in it. And reflects on his Torah day and night. Day and night is an Hebraic idiom, which means constantly, consistently, and regularly. This means the person of blessings is occupied with Elohim's word. The emphasis of the word delights or kephets is that the desire or favor towards something is caused in the subject by intrinsic qualities that are found in the object that it desires or favors. <clears throat> Elohim's word is found on his or her mind and in his or her heart at all times in all circumstances, purposes, and areas of his life or her life. Each reflects on his Torah day and night it will be habitual. Kephetz is a comprehensive word for the study and application of Elohim's word to a person's life. It requires thinking about what Elohim's word means and how, when, and where it will be applied. This includes reading Elohim's word, hearing it, studying it, and memorizing it so we can reflect on Elohim's word accurately and apply to it, uh, I'm sorry, apply, apply it so it will be a lamp to our feet and a light to our paths. Isaiah 48:17 declares, This is what Yahweh, your kinsman redeemer, the Holy One of Israel says, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. I am the one who teaches you how to succeed and who leads you step by step in the way you should go. And that's the introduction. So here comes the uh, 
first point of the sermon. King David was a great example of seeking Yahweh's face step by step so that he could walk in his ways. He humbly asked Yahweh to direct his steps daily. King David knew Elohim and that he rewarded those who diligently sought him. His natural desire was to submit himself to his Elohim and ask Elohim to teach him to walk in his ways. Psalm 86, 11 and 12 says, Teach me more about you, how you work and how you move, so that I can onward and walk onward in your truth until everything within me brings honor to your name. With all my heart and passion, I will thank you, Yahweh my Elohim. I will give glory to your name always and forever. King David understood how amazing it was that Yahweh loved him. Majestic Elohim, whom all nations will worship, hears the heartfelt plea from anyone who asks, Teach me your way, Yahweh. Psalm 8611 also shows a paradigm shift in this psalm. In Psalm 86, 1 through 7, King David desperately cries out for Yahweh's help. When he did this, he reflected on who Yahweh is and on his ways. His reflection on the master of the universe did not make David withdraw his cry for help, but it did make him declare, I need to learn from my majestic Elohim, saying, Teach me your way, Yahweh. King David understood the greatest need revealed to him was to learn to walk in Yahweh's ways. He declared in Psalm 25, 4, Make your ways known to me, O Yahweh, and teach me your paths. Many of us, while in prayer, are concerned about deliverance, help, guidance, and daily living. We are not nearly as concerned to be taught Yahweh's ways and to serve Him with an undivided heart. James 1, 7, and 8 tells us, When you are half-hearted, and wavering, it leaves you unstable. Can you really expect to receive anything from Yahweh when you are in that condition? I can walk onward in your truth. King David's determination gave him an undivided heart to cry out, teach me your paths. He wanted to be taught so that he could live and walk in Yahweh's ways. This wasn't merely to satisfy intellectual curiosity or to win arguments, it was to live. Walking in the scripture takes in the whole of our conversation or conduct. To walk in anything intends a fullness of it. For a man to walk in pride is something more than to be proud. It says that pride is his way, his element, and his holy under the influence of it. With all my heart and passions, I will thank you, my Yahweh. David knew he could only walk in Yahweh's ways with a united heart. No person with a divided heart could walk in Yahweh's ways. Our minds are apt to be divided among the variety of, a variety of things, but our great desire should be to have all our heart and passion dedicated towards Yahweh our Elohim and Messiah and Messiah alone. With all my heart and passion refers to a united heart. It is to be unified in all of the plans, goals, and tasks of our hearts to reverence and to glorify Yahweh's name. This should be our primary passion. A divided heart brings with it curses. Having divided passions provides confusion and doubt. When our hearts are not unified, they are not reliable. Division of mind and heart destroy our good works. James 4, 7, and 8 exhorts, Surrender to Yahweh. Stand up to the devil and resist him, and he will flee in agony. Move your heart closer and closer to Yahweh and he will come even closer to you. Make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners, and keep your heart pure, and stop doubting. Only our hope for a united heart comes from our union with Messiah. 
His perfect and undivided heart now belongs to us. If our hearts are divided they, and not unified, they are open for duplicity. That is a spiritual reality we will fully realize at some point. It is so true today as we grapple with divided loyalty hearts. We must remember the truth that our hearts are united in Messiah alone. There is no easy battle against double-mindedness. This is an issue coming from rebellious, uh, rebellion. James' book reveals how to have an undivided heart and a single-minded devotion to Yeshua. Our hearts must be unified, not divided, so that the Father's work can be done. If our hearts become divided, we cannot perform our work. King David's prayer must be cried out from every believer. We must declare that a united heart is our goal. The way of this goal is to teach me your way, Yahweh, and I will walk in your truth. David declared that a unified heart cannot occur in our own power. Rather, he asked Yahweh to unite his heart as he was taught and as he walked in the truth. Since Yahweh's Elohim alone, King David desired for his heart to be unified with Yahweh alone. Scripture reveals that the notion of having a unified heart stems from the Old Covenant writings and is one of the many promises found in the New Covenant writings to give us a unified heart. Ezekiel 11, 19 and 20 reveals, I will give them a singleness of heart and put a new spirit within them. I will take away their stony, stubborn heart and give them a tender, responsive heart so they will obey my decrees and regulations. Then they will truly be my people, and I will be their Yahweh. As part of the New Covenant writings, we can pray confidently for Yahweh to work in us a unified heart. Yeshua is the way, the truth, and the life. He is our way our truth and our life in John 14 6 when he we say he is our way we say teach me your way when we say he is our truth we say I will walk in your truth when we say he is our life we say unite my heart to fear your name this is the way of Yahweh in his son we find his ways in his son In his son we find his ways. In his son we find his life. In unifying our hearts with Messiah, we then are able to walk in Yahweh's ways. With all my heart and passion, I will thank you, my Yahweh. This is what David desired more than anything else with his united heart. King David desired to worship Yahweh and walk in his ways. King David understood that Yahweh was worthy of his worship even at times when he was not worthy to worship him. He knew he could only be worthy to praise Yahweh with a unified heart. Revelation 4.11 proclaims, You are worthy, Yahweh our El and Elohim, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and for your pleasure they were created and exist. King David's overriding desire was to worship Yahweh with a united heart. His heart became so entwined with Yahweh's heart that he understood worship as the primary way to a unified heart. When we are determined to focus our attention on our minds, emotions, and desires on who Yahweh is and what he has done for us, our hearts are miraculously united and we can then walk in his ways. Here is where Yahweh, or here's where Elohim begins in practical terms to answer our prayers with a with our hearts absorbed in praise. Nothing can add to Yahweh's Shekinah glory, yet worship exalts him in the eyes of others. When we praise Yahweh our Elohim to our families, friends, and neighbors, we in turn bring praise to his glory, honor, and power. We become living displays and trophies of his majestic name. King David, point two. King David chose the faithful way, the path of righteousness, 
which is found only in Yahweh our Elohim. If we stay focused on Him, we will not lose our way. I have chosen the faithful way. David declared that there is only one avenue for walking in the ways of Yahweh. That is the faithful way, which is also known as the path of righteousness of Yahweh. Psalm 119.30 says, I have chosen the faithful way. I have placed your ordinances before me. I have placed your ordinances before me. This is how King David was able to walk in the way of truth. He walked in, the, in close relationship with the living word of Elohim, our pre-incarnate Messiah. Proverbs 6.22 declares, Torah is a bright beam of light shining into every area of your life instructing and correcting you to discover the ways to righteous living. Torah is a bright beam. Solomon broadly quotes Psalm 119.105. When given attention and properly understood, Yahweh's word brings the bright beam of dazzling light to us in the darkness of sin. Psalm 16.11 reveals, Because of you I know the path of life as I taste the fullness of joy in your presence. At your right side, I experience divine pleasures forevermore. Because of you, I know the path of life, as I taste the fullness of joy in your presence. King David understood the benefits of his commitment to Yahweh, where it were received in this life and in the life beyond. The path of life is something enjoyed by both now uh, by the both now and in eternity with the Messiah. Yahweh gives believers eternal life to enjoy as a present gift, a future gift, and an eternal gift. I taste the fullness of joy in your presence. The fullness of joy King David experienced in his life was reflected in Yahweh's presence. It was a temporal gift as well as an ultimately eternal gift. At your right side, I experience divine pleasures forevermore. Yeshua was pierced in his sight with the spear of humanity's hatred. He was wounded for our rebellion and pierced because of our sins. Isaiah 53, 5 proclaims, It was because of our rebellious acts that he was pierced and because of our sins that he was crushed. He endured the punishment that made us completely whole. And in his wounding, we, are found, we find our healing. Eternal pleasures are found hidden in the wounds of Messiah, by whose stripes we are healed. This is where Yeshua responded to the world's hatred when his blood and water flowed from his side. The phrase completely whole is the Hebrew word shalom, which means to have peace, prosperity, wholeness, success, well-being. We have been given these things to us through Messiah's sufferings. Forgiveness and grace permeated his cross. It is at the cross where we find our ultimate healing. It is the vehicle to where we are now seated with Messiah at his right hand to rule and reign with him. Ephesians 2.6 exclaims, He, Yahweh, raised us up with Messiah the Exalted One. And we ascended with him into our, the glorious perfection and authority of the heavenly realm. For we are now co-seated as one with Messiah. Peter quoted Psalm 16 in his message at Pentecost. It reveals that instead of being punished for his glorious work on the cross, Yeshua was rewarded as prophetically described in Psalm 1611. Psalm 1611 reveals, Because of you, I know the path of life. As I taste the fullness of joy at your, in your pleasure, at your right side I experience divine pleasures forevermore. At your right side I experience divine pleasures forevermore. David had full confidence that his life was with Yahweh, both then and eternally. His faith was rewarded by divine pleasures for eternity. To, this is life lived above shallow entertainment and excitement. 
These divine pleasures are enjoyed at a place, which is heaven. Believers are destined to enjoy pleasures at the right hand of Yahweh. At your right side I experience divine pleasures forevermore. Believers have life and beyond. We have divine pleasures forevermore found at the right hand of Yahweh, not separated from him. Isaiah 2.3 tells us, Many peoples will come and say, Everyone come, let us go up higher to Yahweh's mountain, to the house of Jacob's Elohim. Then he can teach us his, his ways and we can walk in his paths. Zion will be the center of instruction, and the word of Yahweh will go out from Jerusalem. All nations will travel to Messiah's capital city. Come, let us go up higher to Yahweh's mountain, to the home of Jacob's Elohim. Then he can teach us his ways, and we can walk in his paths. During the millennium, the citizens of earth will acknowledge and submit to the reign of the great king. He will rule over a perfect government of righteousness in this dimension of space and time. Non-Jews will learn spiritual truth. In the millennium, people from everywhere will realize that Elohim's truth is relevant to their lives. They will want to know it and live according to it. Non-Jews will come and say to their neighbors, Come, let us go up higher to Yahweh's mountain, to the house of Jacob's Elohim. Then he can teach us his ways and we can walk in his paths. Israel will become the attraction of non-Jews, which is seen in Isaiah 60, 1-14. Jeremiah 3.17 and Zechariah 8.20-23. They will come to Jerusalem and learn Yahweh's ways and walk in his path. Zion will be the center of instruction and the word of Yahweh will go off from Jerusalem. This reveals that there is only one way to heaven and Elohim's word will go off from Jerusalem. During Messiah's millennial reign, his kingdom, his instructions, and his good news message will go out from Mount Zion, and Elohim's word will be sent out from Jerusalem to the nations. Jeremiah 3.16 and 17 reveals, In those days you will be fertile, and your population will increase in the land, declares Yahweh. People will no longer talk about the Ark of Yahweh's covenant. It no, will no longer come to mind. They will not remember it, miss it, or make another one. At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of Yahweh. All nations will gather in Jerusalem because the name of Yahweh will be found there. They will no longer follow their own stubborn and evil ways. This is the ultimate fulfillment that Yeshua pointed out to the Samaritan woman in John 4.22, when he said that salvation comes through the Jews. There is no other source of salvation in humanity. John 4.22 says, Your people do not really know the one they worship, but we Jews know, or worship, I'm sorry, but we Jews worship out of exper our experience, for it is from the Jews that salvation is available. Yahweh's Torah and means of righteousness will continually proceed out of Jerusalem. Salvation will come to its fullest completion because it will be sent out from the Jews who live in Jerusalem. What began for Israel at Mount Sinai will ultimately be fulfilled during Messiah's millennial reign in the Millennial Temple, which will be on the Temple Mount, on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Isaiah 30, 20 and 21 reveals, Though Adonai may allow you to go through a season of hardship and difficulty, he himself will be there with you. He will not hide himself from you, for your eyes will constantly see him as your teacher. When you turn to the right or turn to the left, you will hear his voice behind you to guide you, saying, This is the right path. Follow it. Though Israel will experience a season of hardship and difficulty during the Great Tribulation, the second half of the Tribulation, Adonai will ultimately restore her to himself after it is over. When Israel is restored, Yahweh will provide two types of guidance to his Holy Spirit. First, they will receive outward supernatural guidance through teachers who will teach them the word. In contrast to rejecting these teachers, who will be Christians, the Jews will joyfully listen to them. 
Israel's teacher will not be hidden from her eyes. Israel will see Messiah Yeshua as he really is. Rejection of the word will be a thing of the past. Adonai, will, uh, Adonai tried to teach them, but their stubbornness had blinded their eyes and deafened their ears to the whole truth that was and is found in Yeshua. Because of the judgments, uh, our judgment of the great tribulation Israel will experience, her eyes and ears will be open to what her true Messiah Yeshua had tried to convey to her throughout her history. Secondly, Israel will receive inward guidance from the still small voice of Yahweh's Holy Spirit. As opposed to her rebellion before, Israel will be able to hear Elohim's living word in his fullness. In Isaiah 30, 21, Adonai conveyed to Israel and her people that whether they turn to the right or to the left, their ears will hear his voice from behind them saying, this is the path to walk in it. Going to the last point, Isaiah and Jeremiah encouraged all of Israel to look for the faithful way in the ancient pathways, which are found only in seeking Yahweh our Elohim. Jeremiah told Judah to stand in the waves and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is. Even though they were backslidden, there was no wisdom available for Judah to follow. Is Jeremiah 6.16 reveals, this is what Yahweh says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask which paths are the ancient reliable paths. Ask which way leads to blessings. Live that way and find resting for yourselves. They found wisdom in asking where the ancient paths led to the paths of righteousness. The Holy Spirit gave Judah's inhabitants wisdom to learn from what Yahweh had done previously for them. Yahweh's people, both Jews and non-Jews, have, have been exhorted to follow the ancient paths to find the paths of righteousness because they are tried and true paths to walk in the ways of Yahweh. The ancient paths and good way are always the same. They are the way to, of Teshuvah with repentance, reconciliation, reverence, and Elohim's love. They are the ways leading to holiness. There is wisdom, life-saving wisdom, in the ancient paths of Elohim's word from days gone by. To benefit from ancient paths, Yahweh commands us to position ourselves to find those ways. To benefit from the ancient paths, Yahweh tells us to seek diligently for them so that we can see them. To benefit from the ancient paths, Yahweh commands us to ask for them and to desire them. To benefit from the ancient paths, Yahweh commands us to see them as the perfect way in seeking for Him. To benefit from the ancient paths, Yahweh commands us to determine to walk in them. Jeremiah 6.16 reveals, this is what Yahweh says, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask which paths are the ancient reliable paths. Ask which way leads to blessings. Live that way and find a resting place for yourselves. Live that way and find a resting place for yourselves. This is the rich reward for seeking, seeing, and walking in the ancient paths. This reward cannot be matched by anything that this world offers. Yeshua broadly quoted Jeremiah 6.16 in referring to rest for your spirits in Matthew 11. The Father is in Yeshua. Yeshua is in the Father. They are united as one. Their paths lead us to refreshment. Matthew 11, 28 through 30 exhorts, Are you weary carrying a heavy burden? Come to me. I will refresh your life, for I am your oasis. Simply join your life to mine. Learn my ways, and you'll discover that I am gentle, humble, and easy to please. You will find refreshment and rest in me, for all that I require of you will be pleasant and easy to bear. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good ways are. Walk in them, and you will find rest for your spirits. The messianic typology cannot be lost, because they provide us a picture 
of salvation. Yahweh urged his people to find the ancient path so they could find their destinies. Their true purpose of looking toward the ancient paths was to find the good ways marked by Yahweh's faithfulness. In them we find his forgiveness and our destinies. Yahweh can reach from the distant paths to reveal which paths we should walk in with him. These path pro paths provide courage to face our future destinies. Understanding the glory of Yahweh as revealed to Israel on Mount, at Mount Sinai and Yahweh's love as revealed by his longing that it might be well with them gives us all the more reason to obey him. Deuteronomy 5.33 says, Follow all the directions Yahweh your Elohim has given you. Then you will continue to live life and live life will go well for you and you will live for a long time in the land or destinies that you are going to possess. What we are having trouble obeying, I'm sorry, when we are having trouble obeying Abba Yahweh, we are clearly lacking in one of two areas. <clears throat> we either forget His Shekinah glory or we forget His love for us. Sometimes we forget both of them. You must walk in the way which Yahweh your Elohim has commanded you. Elohim's word is to be like a road or highway to the paths of righteousness on which we are commanded to travel. In Psalm 119.105, King David wrote Yahweh's word in, the, in his truth's shining light, which guides me in my choices and decisions. The revelation of your word makes my pathway clear. Proverbs 8.20 declares, I lead you in the way of righteousness to discover the paths of true justice. Walking in Yahweh's ways and in his word are how we will experience success walking out our destinies. We will not find our destinies along the paths of righteousness if we neglect these. Micah 6 8 says, You mortals, Yahweh has told you what is good. This is what Yahweh requires of you to do what is right, to love mercy, and to live humbly with your El Elohim. Micah the prophet saw Elohim's courtroom where Yahweh said, Stand up, plead your case in front of the mountains and let the hills listen to your request. Micah was the defendant in the witness box. Yahweh essentially said to Micah, you act as if it is some mystery that I require of you. In point of fact, it is no mystery at all. I have shown you clearly what is good and what I require of you. Do what is right, love mercy, and live humbly with your Elohim. Yahweh answered the contentious witness in his heavenly court. What I require of you is not complicated. Simply do these, th uh, these three things. Do what is right means to act in a just and fair way toward others. Treat as you would want to be treated. This is the ultimate fulfillment of living our Messiah Yeshua's golden rule. Matthew 7.12 declares, In everything you do, be careful to treat others in the same way you would want them to treat you. For that is the essence of all Torah teachings and the prophets. Love mercy means to not just show mercy to those you deem unfit or enemies, but love to show it. Give others the same measure of mercy you want to receive back from me. Luke 6.38 says, Give generously, and generous gifts will be given back to you, shaken down to make room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out upon you with such an overwhelming measure that it will run over the top. The measurement of your generosity becomes the measurement of your return. Live humbly with your Elohim it means to remember who I am, your Elohim. If you keep that in mind, you will walk humbly before me, you will be exalted because of your dazzling humility. Humility must be at a heart attitude that flows spontaneously in every act a person performs. Walk humbly when we are spiritually strong. Walk humbly when we have much or little work to do. Walk humbly in all our motives. 
Walk humbly, studying Elohim's word. Walk humbly when under trial. Walk humbly in our devotions. Walk humbly between us and our family and Messiah. Walk humbly when dealing with others. Humility is thinking of ourselves correctly, not proudly. When we realize what we really are, we will be humble. We are nothing to write home about. True humility guards us and keeps us safe. True humility gives us joy. True humility will make us walk with a spring in our step. Humility makes music in our hearts when we are asleep. Exercising true humility in this life helps transform us into the likeness of Messiah. He has shown us. What Yahweh requires of us is not mysterious or difficult. Humility practices Yahweh's ways. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no Torah against these things. The conclusion is, there really is not a big mystery to walking in the ways of Yahweh. It is really encapsulated in the fruit of the Holy Spirit found in Galatians 5. It is by his fruit we find the path of righteousness. Paul exhorted us in Galatians 5, 24, Since we are living by the Holy Spirit, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every area of our lives. It is by following his leading we walk in Yahweh's ways. The Holy Spirit produces in believers divine love in all its varied expressions. He produces a joy that overflows. He produces a peace that subdues. He produces a patience that endures. The Holy Spirit produces in believers a kindness that results in action. He produces a life full of goodness. He produces a faith that overcomes. He produces a gentleness of heart. And finally, the Holy Spirit produces in believers a strength of spirit. Romans 8.14 declares that the mature children of Yahweh are those who are moved by the impulses of His Holy Spirit. Romans 8.14 can also be stated, all who are led by the Spirit of Elohim are the children of Yahweh. If we seek to be led by the Holy Spirit, He will reveal to us the wisdom to find the ways of Yahweh. As mature children of Yahweh, the mysteries of the kingdom and its paths of righteousness have been revealed to us by Abba Yahweh through his Holy Spirit in Matthew 13, 11 and Luke 8, 10. In benediction, Isaiah 26, 7 and 8, the path of righteousness is smooth and level. Elohim, the just one, will make a clear path for them. Yes, we will follow your ways, Yahweh, and entwine our hearts with yours. For the frame of your name, or I'm sorry, for the fame of your name is all that we desire. Yahweh has blessed you and will protect you. Yahweh has smiled on you and has been gracious to you. Yahweh has shown you his favor and will give you his shalom, perfect and complete peace. Amen, amen, and amen.